Good morning, afternoon, and evening to everyone from wherever in the world you might be joining us. I would like to welcome you all to today's event, Sisterhood and Beyond, Keeping Up Momentum on Feminist Change, a really timely conversation in which we hope to learn from majority world feminist leaders and thinkers who are galvanizing the movements demanding for gender justice in the so-called Global South. I'm Carmen Leon Himmelstein, and it is my great pleasure to introduce this dialogue and bring these incredible leading feminists to the microphone. Yesterday, as you know, was International Women's Day, and as many of our audience will know, in recent years, this date has become one of the most important in the feminist calendar. Since the early 1900s, the 8th of March has galvanized mass mobilization of women demanding their economic and political rights. In recent times, revolutionary feminist movements are radiating from epicenters outside of the so-called global north, and their continued courage is delivering change. Recent examples wins from across the world include legislation of abortion in Argentina in 2020, a new constitution for Chile, a popular and radicalized resistance to femicide in Mexico, new laws on digital sex crimes and voluntary interruption of pregnancy in South Korea, and Palestine's ratification of CEDAW. But there has also been serious backlash. In Mexico, the rate of femicide has intensified with 10 women killed every day up from seven in 2017. In Palestine, CEDAW has been ratified but faces significant resistance from conservative sections of society and the marriage law is legislated but not enforced. In Poland, abortion rights are being reversed and women all over the world face the very real threat of patriarchal violence, gender discrimination and oppressive stereotypes. To explore the driving forces and successes behind today's explosive feminist-led movements, I'm excited to say that we have great speakers joining us for this conversation. So let me now introduce our distinguished guests. Saina Bangura, Her Excellency Bangura, is a relentless advocate for conflict resolution and reconciliation and a human rights champion. Currently, she's Director General of the United Nations Office at Nairobi. Erika Yamada, Coordinator of States and Projects for the Sexual and Reproductive Rights and Violences Program in Equidad de Género and the Network for Sexual and Reproductive Rights in Mexico. She's also co-founder of Colectiva Dignas Hijas in Mexico. Javier Amanzi, a sociologist and researcher who is the spokesperson for Coordinadora Feminista 8M in Chile, which is the leading national feminist organization mobilizing the massive 8th of March women's strikes, protests, and mass demonstrations all over the territory. Finally, Yara Hawari, a decolonial feminist and senior policy analyst at Palestine's Policy Network and think tank Aisha Baka and host of the podcast, Rethinking Palestine. This event is the first in a three-part ODI gender justice series, centering women's journeys from adolescent girls to young feminists through to future political and institutional leaders. ODI convenes events with a whole host of stakeholders from a wide range of sectors. And today we're lucky enough to be hearing from women at the forefront of the resistance. Today will be undoubtedly radical, political, and full of new perspectives. I hope we can learn something together from these women doing the hard graft of fighting for an alternative feminist future. Today, our conversation will explore three core themes. First, sharing lessons from the grassroots progress made in recent times on women's rights. Second, how feminist movements have mobilized and the tools behind this and third, our visions for a new feminist future. And I'm also very happy to share that we are expecting over 400 people joining us today from over 35 countries, making this a truly global conversation. And we would like to encourage discussion among our wonderful audience and our feminist speakers. So please do use the Q&A box to send in your questions for our panel and our digital shepherds will be keeping an eye on the chat to send them my way. And if you are on Twitter, we will be using the hashtags IWD2021, 8M, and Choose to Challenge. 
And we are posting this and some Twitter handles in the chat box now. We are also live on YouTube and Facebook. So please share the stream and like the video if you are enjoying the event. And we can bring even more people to this exciting conversation. Our discussions have a hard stop at 4 p.m., but we will try to get through as much as possible. And please be aware that Yara might need to sleep off if we do run over time. And now let's meet our distinguished first speaker, Saina Bangura, who knows ODI well through her role as our distinguished fellow. Her thought leadership has led her to become Director General at the United Nations Office at Nairobi. And Saina has decades of experience in driving gender affirmative and inclusive policy initiatives at the international level. She's also well versed in navigating the delicate diplomatic environment and context within which political change occurs. We will now hear directly from Sainab about her journey fighting for this important cause. Thank you so much, Sainab, for being with us today and over to you. Kama, thank you very much. I, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak in this forum. As you mentioned, I have had a long engagement with the Overseas Development Institute for years, and it really has been honored and privileged to be here today as one of their distinguished fellows. The first thing I wanted to say, um, I'm really happy that we have speakers across the world, not just in one continent. Because one of the things that for me, I always say is that gender issues cut across continents, religion, ethnicity, or any form of identity or religious orientation. They are global issues. As long as you're a woman, you suffer from the same challenges women in Latin America, in the Middle East, in Africa and Europe suffer from. So that's one of the most important things. And I think that has helped us in developing the international solidarity because our issues are the same in respect of where you come from. We're disadvantaged, we suffer from the same problem, maybe in different ways, but they're the same problem. So I think that's the one thing that we all have to understand. I became a women's rights activist by accident, but I think it's also because of what I went through my personal experience that led me to question why did it happen to me? I grew up from an extremely poor background. My parents were both illiterate. My father was a Muslim cleric. My mother comes from the most traditional part of Sierra Leone where women cannot be leaders. And today, as I speak to you still, a woman is still part of the husband property when the husband dies. So you belong married, you move from your own family to the other family, you never go back. But I grew up with my, as I said, my father was a Muslim cleric. He wanted to marry me off at the age of 12. My mother said no, because my mother grew up as a maid in the capital city. She was a house girl and she was not given the opportunity to go to school, but she lived in an environment where she saw other girls going to school. And she knew what it meant. So she made a commitment to herself that I'll do everything if I, if I ever get a child, I'll make sure the child goes to school. It turned out I was an only child. She married a Muslim cleric. And so I, I went to school. So I learned the Quran first before actually going to um, English school. Well, at the age of 12, my father, being a Muslim cleric, married, wanted to marry me off. My mother said no. So he walked out. He kicked us out of the house. He left us, my mother packed our things and went to the village. So I grew up as my mother's child, very, very poor, but my mother instilled it in my head that the only thing that was going to help me or us move out of that poverty was education. So she did everything she could, selling her things for me to go to boarding school. The last year in high school, she was not able to meet the financial commitments. I was lucky to have a principal who was a woman, educated. She made a special request to the government because I was the head girl, the senior prefect in school. So she made a special request to the president that she didn't want to see this brilliant girl drop out of school. So the government 
accepted and gave me a scholarship to pay. This was actually the third time to pay for my, my school fees. So by the time I finished, I then went to sixth form and I went to university. When I went to sixth form at the Annie Walsh Memorial School, my mother could not buy me shoes. She could not buy me uniform. Somebody who had attended the school for me, she's now in Trinidad, Tobago, she actually gave me a uniform. But because I remembered what my mother had taught, taught me, that if you get an education, the, the, the sky is the limit. You can be somebody. So that's one I believed in. I proudly put on those old uniforms and went to sixth form. And I went to university. I went to university with, I think it's about five dresses, one pair of skulls, one pair of sandals, one slippers, and even my matriculation white. I had to sew it with my own hand. So it was a very difficult joining. But I never for one moment hesitated and determined that I needed to have an education because my mother had instilled me. And just as I finished my uni university, I, I started working. I went to the UK at Nottingham University and City University Business School to do my postgraduate in insurance studies. I came back home, my mom died. And so when I went to the, at that time I'd met my late husband, I had already had a son. I went to the funeral for my mom to bury her. My father had to call because my mother, our tradition, my mother was still legally married to him, even though he had left us for over 20 years. So we had to find my father. He came to the funeral. He said, my then, well, we're not married. You know, my partner cannot partake in the funeral of my mother because we were not legally married. And taking into consideration the relationship between my mother and myself, I decided to put the cops and go and get married and then come back to the house and then allow the, my now husband to bury my mom. After that, I was so disappointed the way I was treated because I questioned my, I didn't know anything about women's rights. I asked myself, how can this happen? By then, I had finished university. I had finished university in the UK, came back home, an insurance executive driving my car. And I said, but how can this happen? This man who's left us, who has nothing to do with my life, can still come to the village and dictate what happens to my mother and me. And I spoke to one or two people, and they said to me, the best place you need to go is UNDP. I walked myself because the anger was so much in me and I walked to UNDP and I met the woman who was then the UNDP rep in Syria, Zara Nuru, spoke to her and I explained my story. She said, Zainab, since I came to Sierra Leone, I have wanted to do something on women's rights. What happened to you is not unique because in your country, religious Tradi traditional laws are recognized by your constitution. Even though the constitution says we're all equal before the law, the next paragraph it says, customary and traditional laws are recognized. And it depends on which part of the country you come from. When it comes to women's rights, inheritance, child custody, the particular, the tradition or customary law, religious law is, in, is used to, so take a decision. And I said, what can I do? She said, you need to get some women around for me. Let's start talking. So I said, okay, give me the names. I, I mean, I was working, I was an insurance executive. So I, I had no idea all this issue about women. She gave me the name, the social, the world social development officer in the, in the Ministry of Social Welfare. She gave me a list of women. I went around to their offices, got them around. That's the beginning of my journey. And I never looked back. We had the first national conference in Sierra Leone Women issue at that time. Just as we were coming together to really start putting a plan together, we had a military coup. So I said, but I said, what is it? She said, well, you know, with the constitution has been suspended about it. So I said, so what do we do? So I, I moved from being a women's rights to being fighting for democracy. 
And this led me, I led the women into the streets. I led the campaign for Sierra Leone's return to democracy in, 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 in Sierra Leone. And that's how we had the first democratic elections in almost three decades. So, so my life moved from being a, from trying to be a women's rights activist to actually being a democracy activist. And once we had the election, and I realized I was not going back. And through that cause of, of fighting for democracy, I actually developed strategic relationships and network. I worked with the media, I brought them on board. I worked with the Labour Congress, I brought them on board. I worked with the teachers union, I brought them on board. I identified the formal sex of the women in the market. I, I mobilized them. I realized that they were very st well structured. They had good um, networks, but within each market. And I brought them and I, I, I went to the United States Embassy. I asked them for support. They gave me the support and I mobilized these women. And I just realized my journey has to continue. So my journey started as the experiences I had as a girl child, my, my, my problem as a girl child, my father wanting to, to, to force me to leave school and then me losing my mother and fighting for my mother's memory and fighting for the advantage. You know, I said to myself, this is man had nothing to play in my life, but here is he still dictating. And then I move, as I said, I move over to become a, 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 a pro-democracy movement. And as a result, at this time, after the election, we still had the war in Sierra Leone. And then I realized I was never going back to insurance. I decided to dedicate my life to set up the first human rights organization in Sierra Leone, Campaign for Good Governance, which became the biggest human rights organization. As a result of that, I started documenting the atrocities of the war. I documented, I had people both behind the rebel line and also government lines. And so at the end of the war, when the whole issue of forced marriage and, and, and sexual violence against women in conflicts became an issue in Sierra Leone, the special court came to me because everybody they spoke to, who is the person that will tell us the story of how the conflicts affected women? Everybody said to the prosecutor, this is, is Zainab. The only person you can talk to is Zainab. Even though I was not a lawyer, the special court asked me to write the story of the conflict, the effect of the war on women, and, and, and the phenomenon of forced marriage. I wrote that report. I gave evidence of the special courts, and that became an international crime. And that's how I ended up in New York at the, the uh, special representative of the, of the sex, you know, sexual violence in conflict. And through the course, I learned a lot of things. And for me, it is the pain I felt and I continue to feel. And when I was special representative of sexual violence in conflict in New York, I dealt with 19 countries, which included Syria, working with the Yazidi girls, you know, and all of the women, whether it's Bosnia, it's Colombia, you know, whether it's um, 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 Iraq, it was very painful. And the question I kept asking myself, why is it that women are always victims? And I think the challenge we have is that now as I sit back in this position and I see how far this journey has taken me and one of the things I have learned is that as women, it doesn't matter where we are we always, always become victims. And I have learned a couple of things on my way. And those are the things that lessons that actually help me. One of them is at the banquet table, you have, there are no reserved seats. Through my journey, I realized that anytime I wait to be called upon, I will never be called upon. So, I ensure that I'm on the table. And I can, I can give you one ex, two, two examples. One example was they were discussing, the World Bank was discussing the issue of local government in Sierra Leone after the war. 
we were not invited to the conference. But I said to myself, how can the World Bank come to Sierra Leone? They are talking about local governments and they will not be able to talk about how women can be part of that process. I invited myself to the conference and they told me, oh, we're not giving you DSA. You're not invited. I said, I didn't come here for your DSA. I came here to make sure my point of view will be reflected in the report you're going to write. So I invited a couple of women and we went there, we spent the three days and at the end of the day, the local government act has a gender parity in Sierra Leone at the level of the ward committee. We made sure it's 50-50. The second experience I can give when I was a, an activist in Sierra Leone, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, was visiting. So I went to the SRSG as usual. And I said, I have to see Kofi Annan. He said, no, Zainab, you cannot see him. I said, why? He said, the timetable is full. You know, we've scheduled his title. I said, okay. I went out. I went to my network. I found somebody, William Shawcross in the UK. I know him very well. I contacted, he was very close to Kofi Annan. I said, Kofi Annan is coming to Sierra Leone. And I can tell you, I have to see him. I have to talk to him because I know the UN might not give him the right story. He said, I'll do my best. He contacted his office. Kofi Annan agreed. And he sent a message to the SRSG. He said, I want to see Zainab. The SRSG called me. Seriously, he was very angry that I was going to turn his program upside down. I said, it's not my fault. But I made sure that before Kofi Annan arrived, I called all my human rights officers across the country. And I sat down and we actually had a strategy and I was able to know which commander was where, what atrocity was committing, who was where on the government side. And I only had one opportunity to meet Kofi Annan at a dinner. I went to the dinner. His people started talking about the development, the DDR, so on and so forth. He, he turned to me and said, Zainab, what is it you need me to know? And I have to tell you, when Kofi Annan went to New York, he said, meeting Zaina Bangra was the highlight of my trip to Freetown. So my lesson to everybody, if you are not on the table, you'll be part of the menu. And as women, we always have to make sure our voices are heard. We are the ones who get affected by problems. We know the issues that are of critical concern to us. So Thank we you, have- Saina. Thank you so much, Saina. Uh, incredible reflections and such an honest account about your personal experiences, such as the challenges to achieve important goals, to continue studying in Sierra Leone and abroad and fighting for women's rights in the context of customary law that could reinforce harm from their, their norms that affect women. And thanks also um, kindly for your opening remarks. We know that you need to head off, but what a great way to frame such an important discussion. And now I want to dive right into the dialogue with our feminist guests. And I will start by opening up the conversation with this first question. Feminists have been making revolutionary progress during the last five years in the so-called Global South, why do you think this is and what have been the main successes? And let me turn to you, Yara, and your experiences in Palestine. Thank you, Carmen, and, and, and thank you to Zainab for that introduction and that, that uh, brilliant and inspiring uh, speech. I think one of the main successes I'm seeing from just a cursory overview is a revival of a more radical feminism and one that really sees the, the interconnectedness of struggles and the, the different dynamics and layers within local feminist struggles. And I think one of the things that has been really helpful in this regard has been communication technologies, namely social media, which has really allowed for much more communication between women from different parts of the world, like, like this panel, for example. Um, now, I'm not going to wash over the negative aspects of social media, and perhaps we can talk about that um, a, a bit later. But I do want to problematize the, the premise of the question 
that there has been uh, revolutionary progress made in the global south in the last five years and, and specifically talk about the case of Palestine, which, which I know well. Um, and I think it might be helpful to break down both the words revolutionary and progress. Revolutionary, as I understand it, means a complete upheaval of the status quo, um, which more or less globally is one of white supremacy of capitalism and patriarchy. And I guess progress, in a sense, would be a move towards that upheaval. Uh, now, of course, progress can never really be measured in this sort of linear way. And there's always going to be gains and step backs at the same time. And in Palestine, I am seeing a lot of step backs with regards to the Palestinian feminist struggle. Carmen, you mentioned at the beginning, Sidao, that Palestine acceded to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women in 2014 as possibly a sign of progress. But I think if considered in the context um, that the governing regime, the Palestinian Authority, is a deeply patriarchal one, one that considers um, including women officers in its human rights abusing security forces as a form of gender equality, um, and also considering that most international organizations, including UN bodies, are deeply implicit in the depoliticization of the Palestinian women's movement, then we might start to view things in a different light. And so I think a lot of the steps back to do with this simultaneous marginalization of Palestinian women from political spaces and um, depoliticization of the Palestinian women's struggle has resulted, has played a fundamental role um, in those steps back. And, and when I'm talking about depoliticization, I mean separating the Palestinian feminist st struggle from its context um, uh, as a struggle against settler colonialism. Um, uh, uh, and I think, you know, this has become really, the, these, these barriers have become really multifaceted, multifaceted and more entrenched in, in the last few decades. But this is not to say that Palestinians have been passive or have taken these steps back uh, and these new challenges lying down. You know, we've seen in the last few years this radical feminism I mentioned earlier reemerge in a lot of Palestinian spaces. Um, Palestinian women are are fighting to have these conversations, which redefine Palestinian liberation as a feminist struggle. Thank you so much, Yara. Brilliant reflections. Well, let me bring in Erika to comment on that now. Thank you so much for the invitation. I am so honored and excited to be here and to share a panel with such amazing women. And back to the question, I believe more and more young women are joining the feminist movements, and this has definitely contributed to strengthening the demands to fight against structural inequalities, particularly regarding gender-based violence against women. Being a feminist in a world built by men is not easy, and we are still a target of discrimin discrimination and stigma. However, feminism is more popular now than ever, and thousands, maybe millions of women now assume and position themselves as feminists, forming stronger and broader network of support. Among the most significant achievements is the growing mobilization to eradicate violence. The more the feminist movement grows, the less the fear to raise our voices against violence. Conjunctures such as the Me Too movement and Niuna Menos, not one woman less, a grassroots movement that started in Argentina seeking to stop femicides, have served as a catharsis to denounce uh, this violence. And it has created massive mobilizations of dignified rage across Latin American countries, such as in Chile and in Mexico. In Mexico, uh, we have demonstrated a world uh, of progress with a mass feminist protests in 2019, condemning violence against women, especially sexual and femicide violence, police brutality and the impunity that permeates the governmental system. We received a lot of international media attention and it has been one of the most recent highlights of the movement in our country. 
These demands have pressured the Mexican government to respond. However, so much more is still needed. Furthermore, it is worth mentioning that in the global south, the Marea Verde, the green tide, which also came from Argentina, is one of the main successes for it, for it has strengthened our movement like never before. It has expanded through many countries, including Mexico. We have a national green tide and many local green tide groups in all of our states. In, in 2019, Oaxaca decriminalized abortion, becoming the second state in Mexico to ensure access to this health service after 12 years. And to date, bills continue to be promoted in different states. We have formed alliances with multiple sectors and worked on a more, con a more solid argumentation. Last year, feminists in Quintana Roo and Puebla took their local congresses and demanded the discussion of these initiatives. We are now part of a national and international community of feminists that advocate for the social and legal decriminalization of abortion and historic advancement has been made in this matter. Thank you, Erika. Javiera, what are your thoughts on this? Well, first of all, I'm truly really happy to be here. For us in Chile, um, one of our main concerns is how we uh, how the feminist movements, it's absolutely a cross-border uh, movement. For us, it's important to see how every part of our um, mobilizations, of our desires, of what we are now changing in our own countries, it's part of a major and internationalist uh, challenge of transformation, of the structural transformations for the lives of every and each one of us. And, of course, it's an important um, it's part of our desire that, and we know that there's no possible change just in one country. What every one of us is doing in every um, part of the globe, it's part of the same um, challenge of transformation. I'd like to say like just five uh, things that I, for us are like part of how we see you know, this uh, cycle of five year cycle of feminist mobilizations. We are seeing a very radical, movement, just as uh, has been said for us, it's very important to say this because we are now, um, the movement that we are part of is now a movement that knows that there's no possible way to change and to eliminate the violence, gender violence. We don't have a massive and absolutely structural transformation uh, in terms of the way they are, the life uh, is organized. How I'm, for, for this, very same question is that it's important for us to say that this must be a movement, an anti-capitalist movement, an anti-racist movement, an anti-extractivist movement, an anti-colonialist movement, because it's exactly in and in every this uh, the the potency and the, the the strength the strength of this movement is precisely the way that we can connect each and every form of violence and the way we have uh, we can change uh, each and every one of these forms in a major and structural transformation uh, and with this desire is something that we are actually seeing nowadays of course and this is a very different form and we want to say this uh, for what can be considered a more liberal or a more uh, hegemonic way of uh, and white form of um, feminism in a second place i want to say that this is a, of course a mass mobilization. In the case of Chile, this has been the most massive mobilization, the 8th of March, since the end of Pinochet's dictatorship. During the revolt that started in the 18th of October in 2019, a feminist protagonism was such, was from the very same day very important, but since the performance of the collective Las Tesis, uh, we could see not only the, this protagonism in Chile, but all throughout the world which of course is part of this, uh, like I was saying, this cross-border um, and very like intimately uh, concern of how every global and local uh, struggle are connected. Um, in the fourth, uh, another thing that for us is very important is how we are talking about work, about unpaid 
care work that in during this pandemic has been uh, held precisely by and principally and majorly by women, by feminist bodies, and who have, have been the front line and who suffer the greatest physical and emot emotional impact at the highest risk of contagious, uh, contagion. Um, we have seen how this is a very important uh, part of our struggles today because we have to consider how the global uh, care crisis has made uh, now we can nobody can um, deny no the that this is part of that the central part of how what the this pandemic sanitary but also economical and political crisis that are we're uh, experiencing uh, throughout the world. And for us, it's precisely the feminist movement, the one that are now uh, being able to have an answer to this problem. And in and to end, uh, I'd like to say that for us, this of course, this the Nuna Menos movement, the Marea Verde, just how you were saying, uh, it's also part of what we now know is this the strength of the feminist strikes, of the women strikes. This that has been like an historical tool of the workers' movement is now has been updated, reinvented, and actualized by the international feminist movement. This is very important because if this um, becomes uh, not only a uh, day that we commemorate, you know, like the Women's Day or the Working Women's Day, but it's a day of revolt, a day of protests, a lay day of mobilizations. And this is also part of this like five days cycle uh, where we can see that for us, it's important to say that during the last three years, for instance, that we've been working on holding this uh, general feminist strike, the 8th of March, um, the change has been absolutely, absolute. In Chile, there's no, there's no, there's no right to the strike. You know? we, we live in a very neoliberalized country, and where the working, uh, most of working class tools have been absolutely criminalized. So then it's the feminist movement that are, we are now talking about the, the strike, the right to a strike, the right to be to, for to the protest, the right to be in the streets. And it's precisely that what has given us, I'd say, um, the protagonism of these last years and the um, strength to, in, a, in the midst of a constituent process, be also part of, a, of the, the first time in the world that there will be a constituent process that the organ that will be holding this um, and will be writing this new constitution will be held exactly by 50% men and 50% women. This is part of what we have gained and this is, is no gift, this is not favor, this is part of our strength and we, the capacity and the what we have uh, gained in the streets. So for us it's precisely that what has, has held them, the strength of the last years and every single thing that we can say that have been in a way a conquest of this mobilization has been part of our common and global um, capacity of being in the streets and in every place that we've been fighting. Thank you so much Javiera and for all your reflections so far. My next question is uh, if you can give some examples of the main challenges that feminist movements are facing in your respective contexts. And also if you can talk to us about the main tools and new ways of organizing for mass mobilization. You have already mentioned the media, the use of digital technologies, but maybe you can tell us a bit about what are these new tools that you are using or the main tools. Um, and, and what lessons can be shared with other feminists who have found it difficult to mobilize. Let me turn to you, uh, Erika. Well, Latin America continues to be the most unequal region of the world, characterized by problems such as poverty, uh, high rates of violence, precarity, informal labor, corruption, impunity and structural discrimination against vulnerable groups. In this context, social movements continue to be criminalized. Human rights defenders and journalists continue to be persecuted and murdered. There is a widespread violence against women and horrible practices such as selling girls continue to take place. 
On a more local level in Mexico, according to feminist organizations, actually 11 women are murdered every day. The cases have actually increased. We are also one of the top countries for sexual abuse, cases of children. We have a candidate for state governor with numerous rape complaints. We have a president who publicly minimizes gender-based violence against the woman. And there is a lack of feminist funding. There is limited budget assigned to sexual and reproductive health services, to strategies to prevent, attend, and eradicate gender-based violence, to promote girls' and women's leadership and empowerment, and to grassroots activism in general. Protesting against this rampant human rights violation crisis is our right. However, the state keeps repeating old practices of repression. Three days ago, the government installed walls around National Palace and the Capitol's historic center prior to public demonstrations to limit women's ability to protest, illustrating yet again that the government is more concerned with monuments than with the rates of femicide and gender-based violence in Mexico. In response to these provocations, feminist collectives turned the walls into a memorial writing thousands of names of femicide victims. Messages were projected with lights and mobilizations were planned and occurred anyways. Yesterday, many women took the streets to protest and the Mexican government perpetrated a series of human rights violations. There were multiple encapsulations. Many protesters were deprived of their liberty for several hours. Some were assaulted and attacked. Even human rights defenders who were there to avoid these situations were shot with, with the gotcha bullets. High officials refused to use dialogue to mediate. There were arbitrary arrests of journalists. Police used tear gas in the middle of a contingency. There were like military who who looked like snipers trying to avoid drones filming the protest and in general there was a disproportionate use of force. Feminists and organizations, uh, we use social media to report these violations and we will keep demanding answers, damage repair to the victims and justice. The Mexican government has a historic debt to the people, especially to women. In the face of the absence of the state and its omissions and failures, we will continue to mobilize and advocate for change. We will continue to resist and fight. As diverse as we are, we will all do so from our different trenches. And as Dr. Yara mentioned before, digitalization has been a key factor to organize mobilizations. Social media has been one of the main means to inform ourselves, to raise our voices against aggressors, to extend our support and solidarity, to form alliances, to even influence regional and global junctures and generate collective changes. With the COVID-19 pandemic, digital mobilization has taken another turn and has given us new ways to connect and interact with each other. Innovative digital strategies are being implemented globally with new platforms. There is a lot of virtual artivism, which is activism with art. Feminist illustrators are making an impact with powerful messages through their art. We have uh, shared also information through radio and podcasts, networks and collectives working on issues related to the advancement of our rights continue to be strengthened. Numerous webinars and workshops are being held. And about the latter, it is worth mentioning that the shift to this online modality has allowed a more inclusive participation in advocacy events that we would be normally, that we no, would normally be uh, 
be unable to attend to, such as the upcoming CSW 65 and the Generation Equality Forum of Beijing Plus 25. Thank you. Thanks, Erica. As a Mexican, uh, I share as well the frustration. Um, Yara, would you say your experiences reflect those of Erica? Um, yeah, I think, you know, we have a lot of uh, shared um, experiences with uh, Latin America and we also have, you know, specific context um, challenges that we face. You know, many of the challenges that we face in Palestine not only come from the Israeli settler colonial regime, but also the Palestinian Authority, um, conservative forces within Palestinian society, and also the international donor community, which has incessantly attempted to depoliticize our struggle. Um, and one of the things that, that we face as Palestinian women that, that so many women around the world face, including in Mexico, is, is the weaponization of our bodies. You know, since its establishment, the Israeli regime has, has systemically used gender tactics, um, such as weaponization of our bodies to oppress us. You know, for example, during imprisonment, if we're arrested, Palestinian women are often subjected to um, gendered violence in an attempt to break them. Um, so, you know, in interrogations, um, there will be sexual harassments or threats of sexual violence to pressure women and girls into signing confessions or to give information. They also use secret services to threaten women and their families, you know, usually um, using sort of patriarchal norms um, to, 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 to shame these women. Um, uh, and worryingly, the Palestinian Authority has also begun to imitate this gendered violence. Um, demonstrations and protests in the West Bank and, and Gaza are often sites of gender uh, violence. P uh, Palestinian um, Authority security forces um, often um, sexually um, verbally sexually harass women telling and also telling them that they should be at home not in the streets um a lot of pressure is put on women and, and girl activists um sometimes security forces even go to women and girl activists homes to 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 uh, put pressure on their their families um uh, but another challenge that we face not only this weaponization of our bodies, but it's the NGOization of the Palestinian women's movement. And by NGOization, I mean this profession professionalization and bureaucratization of civil society organizations. So that where the focus of organizations and groups, um, you know, previously would have been on, on grassroots uh, work has now become centered on project deadlines, on, on budgets, on funding proposals, on annual reports, all of which are answerable to the international donor community. And we also see this NGOization um, reflected in the lexicon of these organizations, where now, you know, many terms and buzzwords um, used in, in, in feminist um, organizations um, have been defined by UN agencies and other international organizations, uh, and is not at all reflective of their indigenous um, language. Um, just to give you an example, you know, this term empowerment is something that we often hear um, in, in spaces, in, in, in aid and development spaces across the world. But in Palestine in particular, it's, it's really very much limited to social economic empowerment and participation in, in decision making domestically, rather than empowering Palestinian women to resist the settler colonial occupation. And, and many projects focus solely on this idea of, you know, household economic empowerment, um, aiming to help women become uh, financially less dependent on male breadwinners. And whilst this is also important, um, it can't be removed from that, that larger context of settler colonialism. And, and it really stands in stark contrast to, to many female-led cooperatives um, that were established uh, during the first Palestinian Intifada. Um, that really were um, uh, a very uh, local indigenous form of resistance. But I just also want to give you know one final example of this this problematic enjoyization. Um, in 2019, uh, the UN, um, various UN agencies and international organizations, as well as Palestinian NGOs, um, launched a campaign um, called My Rights, Our Power. And it was meant to raise um, awareness on women's fundamental human rights. And the whole campaign, and it was focused on the West Bank and Gaza, 
And in the whole campaign, there was not one mention um, of the Israeli military occupation, which is the overall overarching structure of power um, and is the major contributing factor um, to rights violations com committed against Palestinian women. Um, uh, and this is a clear example of the deep politicization of the women's struggle in Palestine, and it does an incredible um, disservice to Palestinian women. And I would say, you know, these really are the main challenges that we're facing. Um, and just to briefly touch on, on the tools, you know, we have to be very conscious that of our over-reliance on social media uh, and, and digital uh, forms of, of, of communication, um, because these are increasingly sites of repression and surveillance. Thank you so much, um, Yara and Javiera. Let me bring you in again on this. Yes, it's very interesting to to listen to to, each of, uh, to other compañeras from other places, precisely because I guess it's part of this in, uh, collective um, imagination that we are actually trying to respond to the to the present and to the struggles of the present. I'd like to say about uh, this idea of the tools, which I think it's very important to share tools, precisely because there's some uh, other women and uh, feminist activists that are listening to us. Um, the first I'd say, and I was already, already talking about that, is the strike. That is actually not a very contemporary or like, or, um, it's, an historical tool, you know, and it's a working class historical tool that nowadays is being held by the feminist movement. And that makes it absolutely a different form of, uh, and changes not only um, the way that we see and we understand what a strike can be, but also the um, it puts one uh, once again, the, um, the necessity of this kind of um, simultaneous, simultaneous mobilization that articulate diverse groups, diverse um, unions, diverse uh, collectives, diverse grassroots organization of different neighborhoods, and the idea of this, this simultaneous mobilization that can occur in each and every country is for us a very important part of our strength today. Um, precisely in that same form is that we understand the strike to be a very multi uh, the multiplication of different forms of action you know different forms to occupy the streets to understand how we can um make a strike of a uh, paid and unpaid work and for us it's very important to to say this because of course most of uh, women are now holding uh, uh, unpaid work of care of um uh, that they do uh, of domestic work that for us it's very important to talk about that and to visibilize that during our strikes. Um, I'm very enthusiastic about this because we held our last strike just yesterday. So of course it's part of something that we, I want to share of how to think of a nowadays a feminist strike, a women's strike in the, in the middle of a pandemic, of course. And um, I want to, uh, and also I want to talk about um, how we can create collective and, and creative use of the public space, of course. I mean, the the example of Las Tesis is a very important and I guess a very um, illustrative way to how to understand our politics today. For In, for the, in the first place, it's an action that is held in the streets. In the streets of every place, it can be in a main avenue or it can be in a very small street in the in um in a place that's very visible or it can be held by uh, neighbors in in a very small neighborhood and in every part of the world it can be translated and this is a very important thing because it can be held as an a situated form of a uh, tool of struggle we we saw how in every and in different countries, for instance, in Mexico, but also in Turkey and also in the United States, etc. There were there would they would not only translate it to another um, language, but also translate it to their own realities. That's very important because of course we can help a common a common purpose, a common struggle. But there's of course very uh, different uh, specific uh, specificities of every. Place. And it's very interesting how feminism can be 
uh, form to understand these the commonplaces, but also the the different um, uh, and the situated realities of every movement in every place. Uh, and in the third, of course, it's a collect a collective action. And this is also very important for us because we have to understand how, in a way, we can uh, exchange and we can um, try every time to connect the most intimate and personal and individual experience with a collective force. And that's also very important because then our, our a feminist movement today is, of course, a feminist collective transformation force. And uh, like in a way, the, our capacity today for us is to say that we can transform the core of our society. And absolutely, uh, to do that, we have to change each and every way it is organized. So I'd like to say like in a third uh, way, and uh, this is a very, uh, I guess, um, simple, but absolutely I guess, and in, in a way, universal tool, I, I'd say, for us feminists, is the capacity and the need to say no. For us, the, just to say no is a political and, um, I guess, a political tool every time. For uh, up in the, And I would like to connect that for us, in a way, with the constituent process. We develop here the idea of this constituent desire, meaning something like, the desire to say no and to do to do so collectively. Uh, we, we, the desire to say no to this reality, no to this normality, no to the death, no to the gender violence, no to the a regime that was uh, having like a, with a constant violation of our human rights, no to neoliberalism, no to more than 30 years of the administration of the precariousness of our lives. And this I guess that's a very important thing because, in a way, for us, the um, radicalness of our movement uh, is also helped precisely because of that. We, the capacity to say and the desire and the need to say no, and in that way we can imagine and collectively, uh, com trans uh, collectively discuss and try to um, and create alternatives. We don't have like an immediate answer, but we know what we don't want now, and we're actually trying with a uh, very radical and mass and mass forms of democracy from the grassroots, trying to develop what we call here in Chile our programa or our program or our, our agenda that's not held by, in a way, institutions, but precisely by the voice of a uh, women, child, um, that from all over the country. Uh, that's that for us is a very important way to connect this um, this uh, this tool of the capacity to say no with this constituent heart of the revolt that we have been experiencing here in Chile, and it's also going to be very important for us to understand what will be the the role of the feminist movement throughout this constituent process that will be starting that has already started, but in terms of uh, like institutionally, will be start will be starting now in April. Uh, this will be the first, I want to say that also, this will be the first constituent process that's been held in Latin America and I guess in the in the world that's been, that is part of this cycle, you know, of this five-year cycle of, mo of feminist global mobilization. That's very important for us and we know that everything that we do here will be very important for our um, sisters in every other country because we are going to be, be able to talk about a abortion about a women's rights in the moment that we are ending with a, the constitution of Pinochet. So it's precisely that that capacity to share what we are now living here in Chile and maybe how this will, uh, what we learn and what we can be able to do here will help and inspire and maybe in a way uh, start other processes in other countries, of course. So I guess, and the uh, to just to, I'd say that today, nowadays, our main main um, tool and our main challenge is to sustain this internationalist and this cro uh, cross-border movement and this permanent conversation, permanent uh, capacity to share what we are nowadays living, not only, and of course, in social media, but how that can also permanently is also connected to what we can do and how can we display and how, how can we 
um, connected with up the mass mobilizations in the streets, in the public space. Thank you so much, Javier, and all of you for your amazing analysis and sharing with us the context of your respective countries, so much commonalities and differences. And moving on to our uh, final question to conclude this part of the conversation, can each of you tell us more about what a feminist future looks like to you and what does the global feminist movement need to do to keep up momentum on feminist change and maybe also keeping the sisterhood and sorority that concept that you already know about. And Yara, shall we start with you as we know that you need to go uh, quite soon? Yeah, thank you, uh, Carmen. And I think global sorority and sisterhood is incredibly important. Um, there are so many things that unite us in our struggle for, in our collective struggles for liberation. And I think it's very hard in this day and age to claim that we don't have access to information about other feminist struggles. Um, and so I think it's very much on us to make those connections and to maintain them. And it, and it sounds simple, but it is hard and it's time consuming work. And for so many women around the world, surviving that, that every day, wherever, whether it's under uh, dictatorship, military occupation, um, whatever, it really, you know, it takes precedence over working on a collective future. And, you know, I think that's totally understandable because the systems of oppression have been created to create, have been created um, or have created that context. Uh, and so for those of us who can, you know, I think we have to embark on this process not just um, for those who can't, but also because in of itself, it's, it's really a process of radical collective healing. And I personally have felt at my best mentally when I have been in spaces with other women, not just Palestinian women, but other women, you know, discussing our oppression, but also our mechanisms of survival and our mechanisms of resistance. So, in a way, I think global sorority and internationalist feminism is a form of self-care. And in terms of a, a feminist future, you know, in Palestine specifically, I want to see a liberation movement that truly incorporates feminism, not just as this afterthought, but as a core part of its political ideology. But I also want to see a Palestinian liberation movement that is internationalist and recognizes its role in building a different world that's free of capitalism, of colonialism and patriarchy all at once. Thank you so much, Yara, for those great final reflections. Um, Javier, would you like to um, follow on answering the question, please? I um, absolutely uh, share every word of Yara. I think that today our major challenge is to connect our uh, our struggles, our global struggles, and the way can, we can make that possible, I guess, it's precisely by trying to permanently be uh, sharing, to be uh, and working on how we can um, gather and create these meetings and these internationalist forms of organizations that of course are not, and I, I'd like to say that, the, I, I really think that nowadays the feminist movement has um, been playing a major role in every one of our countries and we're trying every day to try to construct these, um, these forms of internationalist organizations that where we can meet each of us, but we will never be all, there we won't be able, able to be make a, like a whole one internationalist place. And that, I guess that's part of something that we can say. Uh, it's very important because we are so many that we won't be able to be just in one place. So nowadays, I guess the most important thing we can do is to be able to share in every place we are um, what we are doing so that others can take part of that and that um, what we are learning in one place can help us in others. For us, it's been very important to learn of how, for instance, the Argentinian movement has um, 
being able to connect the institu uh, institutional place and the streets and the grassroots organizations in a main and uh, common purpose, for, for instance, for the right of, um, of a legal abortion. For us, it's very important. We don't have a legal abortion, so we're going to help and uh, we're going to connect with those uh, with our sisters there precisely to help our struggle here. And we know that their, their struggle is also our struggle. So uh, the way we connect and the capacity we have nowadays because of social media, because we are learning about each other, because we are constantly reading about each other, is one of our main strengths. I guess that's the core meaning of what we call compañera. The idea that we are learning, that we are admiring, that we are, uh, and of course, that, and that we are um, being, we're, we feel that we are being accompanied and we're like holding together in each and every one of our fights. Uh, I must say, I'm not actually very much, much of a fan of the idea of sorority because we've seen how that idea in a more, more liberal sense has been held for us to say why we are criticizing, for instance, the Ministry of, of Gender Policies here in Chile. And we want to say, no, we don't, we don't think of a sorority in a way, of, in, a, in an essentialist way. We think of compañeras in a way that we can help a political tool of connecting our struggles, of saying that uh, women uh, must unite in a common fight. Of course, women are also LGBT movements, um, but in a sense of a social and uh, structural transformation, see, not like in a way to say in a commercial idea of that we can all unite without a political content. So I want to, in a way, make a, that polemic because for us it's important to understand that it's not like we are uh, saying that every woman, because there are a lot of women who are in power who aren't actually uh, helping or holding our, the, a feminist agenda in their places. So feminism is much more than just a women's movement. It's a, a, it's, it's a political horizon, it's a political uh, and permanent struggle and it's precisely there that we are now holding our place as Coordinadora Feminista 8M in Santiago, in Chile, at this precisely a little place of the world, and we know that we're connecting that with others. Thanks so much, Javiera, for your insightful comments and reflections. And Erika, let me bring you back in on this question. Um, there were so good interventions. And well, originally, sorority started to be used as a term precisely to unite women, to make us conscious that we should stop competing with each other and on the contrary, stand up to the traditional model imposed by the patriarchy and support and push us to succeed. A woman advancing means an advancement for all of us. And similarly, as Javiera just said, it is also a political statement. We share a common oppression. So through sorority, we have learned to have empathy with other women's struggles and pains. Nowadays, sorority has also been questioned in Mexico because women are not exempt of reproducing schemes of oppression and violence. So we cannot use sorority to excuse those behaviors. In this sense, we have a pending task to analyze, use and apply sorority without falling into these faults. This is very important to ensure uh, the colonial approach and there should not be a selective sorority that excludes women that have been cataloged as the others, the women who have been historically marginalized and excluded. We, we have to embrace diversity and understand how different oppressions such as racism and class intersect and confront ourselves to avoid reproducing this white hegemonic feminism. As Javier also mentioned before, our movement should problematize the power relations and regimes that have differentiated impacts and articulate to transgress them. Global feminist sorority should entail these principles and act in solidarity for causes that, that respect all people's human rights and dignities, contribute to make gender-based violence 
against women and equal inequality visible and facilitate strategies for its eradication. Despite borders, there is a generalized and structural problem of gender-based violence and discrimination against women. As feminists, we share the conviction that it is necessary and possible to work together for a more just and equal world. We all have the common goal of emancipating ourselves from the oppression we face as, a, as women, and together we are stronger and more capable of doing so. And well, also answering, well, I don't know if I have time to answer the, the other part of the question, what does a feminist future look to me? Well, a feminist future is a future where every girl, adolescent, and woman can fully exercise their human rights, where we can all have access to basic health and education services, where we can be whoever we want to be without the imposition of sexist roles and stereotypes, where voices are heard, where we can be the ones leading sustainable solutions to climate change, for example, and be represented in decision-making and power. It is a future where we are not discriminated for gender-based reasons, where inequality gaps no longer exist in any private or public sphere of life, where bodies stop being objectified and sexually exploited, where cases of rape don't even exist, where no girl has to be a mother and no woman has a forced pregnancy or birth. I see a future where no mother has to cry for the femicide of her daughter, where, where, no, where we no longer have to organize mobilizations for all our missing and murdered sisters. It is a future where we can walk the streets without fear and where we can all return safe and alive to our houses every day. Feminist movements fight to make this a reality so, so that substan substantive equality can materialize and we can have countries that comply with their obligations and commitments regarding human rights, adhering to the principles of equality and non-discrimination. We fight for structural transformation that emancipates us from this patriarchal system that has taken so much from us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erika, Javiera, and Yara for your inspiring words and your thought-provoking reflections. And again, as I mentioned, Yara had another commitment, but she sends her sincere apologies it has been such an invite, insightful and inspiring conversation so far, and I'm sure our audience are having similar feelings and lots of questions. So let me share some of the questions that have been asked in the chat box by our um, audience, so you can help us to um, answer as well what, what are your thoughts on, on that. Just give me a few few minutes. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, so I just would like to thank you so much for this great discussion um, and for being with us, sharing all these ideas. Um, and we want to thank our amazing feminist leaders and sisters for sharing such valuable knowledge with us today. Uh, we have heard very clear and important key messages, especially that more women are joining now this movement. It's not only a few anymore, or it's not only young women, it's women from all ages, as, and of course led by young women. We can see that in Chile, in Mexico, in Palestine and also how this has inspired important um, movements such as the Green Tie, uh, Niuna Menos, and all these that we already have heard about. And also these are cross-border movements. These are anti-colonial movements, anti-racist movements, and we are fighting to have the right to protest and to be ourselves, as it was very well mentioned by um, our speakers today. And I think it's also important 
to talk about the challenges. It was very, very uh, important to talk about the criminalization of social movements that is happening, human rights violations as well, using of tear gas and other police violence, as you also mentioned, what happened yesterday in Chile and in Mexico. And also very important, the NGOization that was mentioned by Yara about the focus on budgets, on annual reports, on more admin work that is not really the focus of what NGOs should be supporting or the aid community in general. And that is about um, not mentioning or not dealing with important politicization of um, what is happening as well in the context of Palestine. And in terms of tools, it was amazing to hear the importance of social media, the importance of digitalization to keep movements close to each other and to share as well their experiences, but also the use of more um, other um, tools that have been used in the past, such as streets, organization or collective action. Um, and we have the amazing experience of Chile, Violador and Tucamino and so many others that you already mentioned. Um, so I would also like to thank you all for attending. We know it still remains a challenging year. So thank you for your comments, your questions and engagement. And I would also like to thank uh, all those who registered and you can watch this event again on the ODI website in the coming days. And feel free to share this conversation far and wide by sharing on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And if you are interested in exploring the issues of gender justice, you can find out more about ODI's work on this through our latest reports and work on gender and social movements. There are a few links in the chat box, including on ODI's Aligned platform, which is working on a new program concerning feminist and women's social movements, building on Aligned's flagship report on gender norm change. Thank you again for tuning in and let's get to work and see you all on the streets very soon.